Faith has a substance. It has spiritual weight. And you know what? We all go through periods where we feel like we have a lot of it. Other times, we don't seem to have any of it, or certainly not enough. But did you know God has given to each of us a measure of faith? That's what Romans 12, 3 tells us, that we should think of ourselves with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. Different measures, different assignments. Each of us have been assigned a measure of faith. It's interesting. 1 Corinthians tells us some have been given even a spiritual gift of faith. So have you ever taken a moment to think about your faith? Have you ever compared your faith with somebody else's faith? Or do you think you were given a spiritual gift of faith? I mean, something really beyond what the normal faith is. How would you describe the measure of faith God has assigned to you? Or would you even know it? How about when you're praying for somebody? Do you sense they have faith in what you're praying for? Does their faith even matter? The reality is, actually, it all matters. God has assigned to each of us a measure of faith, and when we get together, the faith of others, or the lack thereof, can affect the effectiveness of our prayers. How does that work? What's going on when that takes place? Well, there's something I call the instigator's faith, and we kind of break it down to three areas. The first one is the instigator's faith. That's the level of faith present and the person is doing the praying. It could be a prayer for healing. It could be a, a prayer for taking a risk in an investment or housing or moving. It's believing that favor or provision will arrive at the precise time that it's needed. That's the instigator's faith. There's also something I call the recipient's faith, and that's the faith of the person who's being prayed for. It's the level of assurance and expectancy that they have while they're being prayed for. They're the ones that need the prayer. There's even something called childlike faith within the recipient's faith. Like the name implies, this is the kind of faith children have, full of innocence. It's unpolluted by the cares of the world. It's unhijacked by the emotions and negative experiences. Childlike faith just simply believes. There's also something called corporate faith. That's what I call the all y'all of faith. That's the collective faith of everyone present in the room. Not just the amount of amens you hear there, but the faith behind the amens. There's one more element that comes into play I should mention, something I call anti-faith. Anti-faith? Yeah, anti-faith. This is what Jesus referred to as unbelief. You may have always thought unbelief was simply a lack of faith, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Unbelief is more than just zero faith, it's actually negative faith. It carries a big minus sign by it. And in the economy of heaven, faith works like invisible spiritual currency. Understanding the structure of that economy helps prayers become much more effective. It also helps you understand why sometimes someone is healed and other times they aren't. The clues are found in the ministry of Jesus. So that's where we're going to start, in the mystery of measures of faith. This is Dreams and Mysteries with John Paul Jackson. So why is it that some Christians seem to have lots of faith while others seem to have so little? Don't we all share the same faith, faith in Jesus? Didn't we all have faith when we made the choice to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Did we somehow lose faith during our Christian walk like change falling out of a hole in our pocket? Well, here's a better question. Can we regain the faith we've lost? First of all, it's important to understand we've each been given a unique measure of faith. In Romans 12, 3, the Apostle Paul makes reference to this. He's talking about how we should think of ourselves as we truly are. And he finishes his statement with a curious ending. And he says, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned to you or given you. 
Interesting, God assigns to each of us a measure of faith. So what does that mean? I can already hear some of you saying right now, I knew it, I bet you I got the smallest serving of faith God ever gave any human being on the face of the earth. No wonder my prayers never get answered. But before you go down that road, let me assure you, that's not the case at all. Everyone has been assigned enough faith to have prayers answered. You've been given enough faith to do what God has called you to do, and everyone has been given enough faith to, number one, believe the Word of God, and number two, share that belief with others. Remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is the Great Commission to all believers. Jesus never said to those of you who received a great, large measure of faith, well, here's what we get to do. And no, and to those of you who got the small measure of faith, just keep tidy around the camp until I get back. Well, the Great Commission was given to every single one of us. Whatever faith God has assigned to you, it's enough faith to get it done. Think about this for a moment. Jesus said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, Little faith. You could speak to a mountain and tell it to be cast in the sea, and it would. A mustard seed was probably the smallest seed traded in the marketplace. And Jesus was saying, it's not about the size of your faith. It's how much of the faith you've been given are you using. God has given to each of us enough faith to do what he's called us to do. And he's given us his Holy Spirit to help us and comfort us along the way. Remember, Jesus finishes off the Great Commission with... Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here's the question. What measure of faith were you given? More importantly, are you using the full measure of faith God gave you? You may have had events in your life that have brought you pain and caused you to lose faith. So now when you pray, you might not do it with the same conviction as you did before. I want to encourage you. You still have all the faith God has assigned to you. But there's something else at play here, and you're going to need to deal with it. It's this mysterious substance called anti-faith. Your life as a Christian will often take place within the tension of these two forces pulling against each other, faith and anti-faith. The enemy knows the power of faith, and that's the first place he's going to attack you. The enemy will fill our minds with fear and doubt. And all of this is intended to build up the substance of unbelief or anti-faith in our heart. Unbelief has to be dealt with, and the answer is the Word of God. The Word of God has the power to neutralize unbelief. The Word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, has the power to separate us immediately from the unbelief that is trying to attack us. And the Bible says the Word of God has the power to divide between the soul, what our mind and will and emotions are fighting, and the spirit. Again, that's that tension, unbelief, soul, and spirit is, is belief. So our, the Word of God has the power to separate those two and to show what is true, and it stands up. And I'll add this, faith from anti-faith is going to be seen more clearly in your life as you begin to get into the Word. You'll be able to distinguish it. Well, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of that which is unseen. Sometimes we take Hebrews 11 to say that faith is hope, but that verse actually says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance is the Greek word hypostasis, which literally means that which stands under. Faith is the foundations of the things we hope will happen. That foundation is God. Faith can't be separated from God. Your perception of God and your relationship with God is all birthed out of that perception, and that is your faith. If your perception of God is wrong, it's like having cracks in your foundation. Cracks start through patterns of thinking, what if God doesn't answer my prayer? What if I'm never healed if I pray? God didn't heal my friend. He's probably not going to heal me either. Why doesn't God want to heal me? God must not love me. 
Thoughts like these are the weapons of the enemy. They keep us from believing what we pray, and sometimes it keeps us from praying at all. Remember, you don't lose faith near so much as you gain unbelief. Take every thought captive. Recognize these thoughts as the enemy sowing unbelief into your heart. I also want to encourage you, find scripture verses that contradict these type of negative thoughts and then make those verses a part of your everyday life. Write them on your bathroom mirror. That's what I did. Program them into your smartphone to pop up as reminders during the day. Write them on sticky notes on your cabinets. Do whatever it takes to change your perception of God and who He says you are. This is how you regain the measure of faith God has given you, by repairing the cracks in your foundation. Your faith is never more real than when it's being put to the test. In the Storms Faith and Miraculous Bundle, John Paul explains three unique aspects of faith that will help you pray more effectively, trust God more, and increase your faith. In Storms Faith and the Miraculous, John Paul describes key principles to strengthen your faith and see the miraculous happen in your life. In Healings and Measures of Faith, John Paul describes the types of faith present during the healing ministry of Jesus. In How God Kills Fear, John Paul shares inspirational teachings that will help you turn your fear into faith and gain victory. The Storms Faith and Miraculous Bundle is being offered for your gift of $50 or more to the ministry. We'd like to send you the CD Storms Faith and the Miraculous, the CD or DVD Healings and Measures of Faith, and the CD or DVD How God Kills Fear. Order yours today by visiting us at dreamsandmysteries.com or call us at 1-800-538-5285. There's this mysterious substance called unbelief that in effect neutralizes faith. If faith is that which allows us to accomplish supernatural feats, then unbelief is the kryptonite that makes us mere mortals. Unbelief even has the power to affect those around you who may be full of faith. I want to show you a picture in Scripture of the struggle that takes place between faith and unbelief, even in the ministry of Jesus. There are two amazing accounts in Scripture that illustrate the tension between faith and unbelief perfectly. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has just returned from the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where he had just cast out a legion of demonic spirits from the Gadarene man. Almost immediately upon returning, a leader of the synagogue named Jairus falls at his feet, begging Jesus to heal his daughter. Jairus had faith that if Jesus would come to his house and pray, his daughter would be healed. Jesus agrees, and he and his disciples begin making their way to the house of Jairus. On the way to heal her, Jesus is touched by the woman with the issue of blood. The faith of this woman is so strong, she believes that if she only touches the hem of his garment, it'll be enough to heal her. He touches, or she touches the end of Jesus' prayer shawl, and he feels power leave him, dunamis leave him. Who touched me, he said. It wasn't the physical touch of his garment that Jesus felt. It was the power that left him through the sheer faith of this woman. Jesus then tells her daughter, your faith has made you well. This is a great example, by the way, of the recipient's faith. She had the faith that she would be healed. Here's where it really starts to get interesting. The Bible says that while Jesus was still talking to this woman, a group of men approached him and Jairus with the news from Jairus' home. And it wasn't good news either. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further, they said, and wham, just like that, unbelief creeps into the heart of Jairus and his wife. But what does Jesus do? Immediately, Jesus does two things. He turns to Jairus and tells him, don't be afraid, only believe, Jairus. Next, he permits no one except the parents and the three disciples to come with him to Jairus' house. Two things. He stops the power of unbelief in Jarius, and he separated the unbelievers from the believers. When Jesus came to the house, he did the same thing. Really amazing. And the Bible says it like this. He put the unbelievers outside the house before entering the girl's room to begin praying. Now, keep in mind, before he even began to pray, he removed the unbelief. Jesus only allowed his disciples and the girl's parents in the room with him. Unbelief is anti-faith. 
And Jesus recognized unbelief could prevent the miraculous from taking place just as it did in his hometown. He took steps to make sure that that didn't happen. In the very next chapter of Mark, Jesus is confronted with unbelief once again. Only this time, it's a little closer to home. Scripture says he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which given to him allows such mighty works to be performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, this the, bro the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not these his sisters that are here with us? So they were offended at him. Can you imagine? They were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now Jesus, he could do no mighty work there. Again, the word dunamis, power. Could no power display there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. This account reveals several interesting details about unbelief. First of all, there's only two places that Jesus marveled. He marveled at the incredible faith of the centurion soldier, and he marveled at the incredible unbelief of those in his hometown. First and foremost, concerning unbelief, it can prevent even Jesus from performing miracles. The Bible clearly says Jesus could do no mighty works, indicating that he probably tried and was unsuccessful. Think of that. Think of that. Faith was hindered, power was hindered because of unbelief. Even Jesus could be hindered by the unbelief of others. The other interesting takeaway here is that a miracle must require more faith than just healing a sick person. Why? Because there was no miracles able to be done, but there was sick that were able to be healed. Finally, in Mark chapter six, verse six, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. What do you think Jesus was marveling at? Was he marveling at their reasoning, that because they knew him and his family, it was impossible to believe he could perform miracles? Or was Jesus marveling at the power of their unbelief? These two passages of Scripture teach us an incredibly valuable principle. There is a quotient of faith required for healing and miracles. Faith adds to that quotient. Unbelief subtracts from it. I see this principle play out throughout the New Testament, and it's caused me to develop what I call the 100 Faith Unit Principle. In my dream, I'm in an old house. I remember being on the second story. I also remember that I am in California, where I currently live. I have a telescope, and when I look through the telescope, I see the East Coast. But I've never been to the East Coast. The dream seems strange. One of the things I really like about dreams is that they once in a while catch you by surprise, meaning what you think they mean isn't really what they mean when you start to uh, interpret the meaning. In this particular dream, the dreamer is, has three things that are very important. One, they're in the second story of a house. Number two, it's an old house in California. Number three, there's a telescope involved. Telescopes they tell us, they basically are telling us the future is coming. You're seeing off of the distance that which lies ahead of you. The old house rep sometimes will represent our past. Sometimes they'll represent uh, our childhood. Sometimes they'll represent old thinking. But in this particular dream, it was particularly noted by the dreamer that she was in an old house in California. This doesn't mean an old house. This actually means old sometimes mean former house or previous house or previous location. House and California in this dream tie together. And that basically says that if you if you're, have a former house in California, that means you're going to have a current house somewhere else. And that is what the telescope is saying. She says she's never been to California. 
I mean, never been to the East Coast, but she saw the East Coast and recognized that she had never been there, but it, was, it felt like a strange dream to her. Basically, the dream is, is saying this. What, second story means you rise above the current things that are going on in your life. So you're rising above that, and the Lord's letting her know that she's getting a view from above her current situation to her future. Telescope says the future. Basically, what this dream is saying then is you're living in California today. One day you're going to be living or at least staying for a period of time in or on the East Coast somewhere. And the Lord's letting you know that that day is coming. Over the last 30 years, John Paul Jackson has studied how God speaks metaphorically through dreams, parables, and proverbs in the Bible. God wants all believers to understand their dreams, and that includes you. For your gift of $60 or more, we'd like to send you the Essentials of Dreams bundle. This bundle includes a two-CD set teaching the basics of dreams and visions, John Paul's advanced six-CD set, Essentials of Dreams and Visions, and a three-CD set on the biblical model of dream interpretation. Also included, the Moments with God Dream Journal, plus four dream cards to help you understand your dreams. Order your Essentials of Dreams bundle today. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. One of my spiritual fathers, John Wimber, used to say, you spell faith R-I-S-K. And in a spiritual sense, that's really true. You can invite the presence of the Lord through prayer. You can strengthen your resolve through the Word. But at some point, your faith needs legs. Take the Apostle Peter on the Sea of Galilee, for example. The power for Peter to walk on the water was there all along, but it wasn't activated until Peter took a risk and stepped out of that boat. Risk activates faith. When you first came to faith in Jesus, you took a risk. Every day since, as you grow and mature in your spiritual walk, you've been presented with opportunities to take more risks. You have a choice. You can take that risk or you can remain in what I call your comfort zone. Here's the danger of staying in that comfort zone. God will begin to nudge you to take a risk. You're in your comfort zone, but God keeps nudging you. He'll nudge you to pray for someone. He might nudge you to give financially when you yourself are having a hard time. He might nudge you to walk through a door that's suddenly open to you. You can make a choice not to take that risk, but spiritually, when you do, your faith is weakened. Here we find faith is strengthened by doing what you believe. If you believe it, but don't do it, how much do you really believe it? There's also another principle at play when you don't act on God's nudges. Your faith is actually weakened. And something else happens. You stop hearing the nudges of the Holy Spirit. So what am I saying? I'm saying there are side effects to not taking God-inspired risks. We squander the measure of faith God's given us. We lose out on opportunities to experience the supernatural take place in our life. Remember, you don't need a miracle till you need a miracle. Faith becomes real when it's exercised through risk. Risk isn't always something you do. Sometimes risk is something you don't do, like trusting God and waiting instead of trying to make something happen. Let me also say this. You don't earn your salvation by taking risks either. Taking risk is merely exercising the rights you already have as a citizen of the kingdom. So how do you spell faith? R-I-S-K. When you place your faith in Jesus, you're doing more than just having your basic needs met. You're doing more than securing a place in heaven. You're empowering the creator of heaven and earth to act on your behalf. That's right. You have the power to empower God to act on your behalf. It happens through this mysterious substance called faith. Faith's the understanding of how the system of heaven works. It's the invisible currency of an invisible economy, and God's made you a major stockholder. Why would God 
and trust something as complex and unfathomable as his kingdom to you and me. That is a big risk. It's a lifetime of trying to find an often disappearing set of footprints using a 2,000-year-old map. But here's the truth. In our relationship with God, He's the only one really taking a risk. He risked it all on us, imperfect vessels. I know some of you are struggling with your measure of faith, so I want to pray for you right now, and I want to ask God to increase your measure of faith. Remember the man who was asking Jesus to remove the demon from his son, and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I think there are many of you watching right now that have a measure of belief, but you also know you have a measure of unbelief. Not the unbelief that is that I would categorize as anti-faith, but the unbelief that says, I, I, I prayed so often and seen so little, I don't know if God's going to do it. I want to pray for you, and I want to ask God to increase the measure of faith you have, and that from this prayer, you're gonna, your life's going to change because you're going to start praying for people, you're going to start doing things, you're going to start hearing the voice of the Lord, the nudge of the Holy Spirit, and people are going to notice a difference in you. It may not, it may not happen in a huge quantum leap, but people are going to notice a difference in you. And if you'll pray with me, at least agree with me, then I, I suspect God's going to do something wonderful to those of you that are watching right now. So, Father, I pray that you'll help the, those who have a measure of faith, but also have a measure of unbelief, not anti-faith, but they're just not sure you're going to act. I ask you, Lord, to increase the measure of faith that they have so that they know when they pray, you will take action. Help them to trust you. Help them to believe that all things do work together for good to those who are in Christ Jesus. Help them, O oh God, to activate and put feet on what you've asked them to do so that they hear more, they experience more, and when they need a miracle, it's not a crisis, it's an opportunity. Father, I ask you to breathe your breath upon them. I ask you to empower them with your Holy Spirit. And in so doing, may they empower you or release you. Remove the limitations they unknowingly have placed on you. May those things be removed and may your kingdom be advanced on earth as is in heaven, and may your name be known. Help us to glorify you and to magnify your name before the eyes of those who don't know you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week on Dreams and Mysteries.